Hi, my name is Brian, and I'm the pastor of Vision at Holy City Church. I'm glad that you found our online sermon resources, and I pray that the Lord would use them to strengthen your faith. I would exhort you not to use our online sermon resources as a substitute for regular involvement in your own local church. That being said, I pray that our teaching resources would be helpful to you and conform you even more to the image of Christ. So we're going to start in chapter 18, verse 33 of John's Gospel. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priest have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting, that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. And Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. And they came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priest and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to them, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement and in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. And they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. Um, this morning, as has been said already, we start our series in Advent. During this season, uh, we take some, um, we take a renewed focus on the birth of Christ, and we think more deeply than we always do. Um, we always think about the incarnation of the eternal Son of God, but this time is set apart as a time to specifically lean in and try to uh, glean more from these glorious realities of Christ who has come. Uh, during the Advent season, many churches sharpen their focus on the glorious reality that God the Son himself, listen to these words, God the Son himself took on human flesh and a human nature so that he might live with us and perfectly bear the weight of our curse and provide our salvation through the very real stopping of his human heart. What we are remembering in the incarnation of Christ is that God, the Son, willingly chose to take on a human nature 
to take on all of the trouble of being human, to take on a human heart with human blood veins and human nerves so that he could lay his life down for sinners like you and me. Brothers and sisters, I hope there's a sense of awe just at this season, at this reality of Christ who has taken on flesh to to be our Savior. This season of increased meditation upon God coming to us through Mary's womb is capable of sparking new joy in Jesus because he was made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted... What's the result of that? What's the joy that comes from knowing this? Because Jesus himself was suffered and tempted, he is now able to help those who are being tempted. I know there's more than one of you in this room who's being tempted. Is there any help for you? Yes, his name is Jesus. And at the incarnation, he did everything so that he might be able to help us. There's great joy in meditating on this. There's also great and marvelous peace and comforting hope in knowing that Jesus Christ came to us. Hear me. I'll say it slowly. Jesus came to us. He didn't give up on sinners. What a mighty and awesome thing that is that he didn't just wash his hands and say, whatever. No, he didn't give up on us, and he didn't simply give an invitation with directions. Loving people would say, I would like to spend time with you, come over on Sunday at 2 o'clock, here's a map to my house, and leave it. We would say, that's welcoming, that's hospitable, that's loving and kind. Jesus Christ did far more than make an invitation and draw a map. He came to us. He took the initiative. Do you know how much stuff waits in the balances because no one will take the initiative? (laughs) Jesus, God, the perfect, the sinless one, looked at a, a world full of sinners and said, I will take the initiative. Move toward them. Not only did he take the initiative, but he bore the cost He bore the cost of redeeming rebels. Brothers and sisters, I pray that this never grows dull. Jesus Christ bore the cost not to redeem a precious dog that always obeyed his commands. He bore the cost to redeem rebels. We as rebels would never have made it to him. No invitation couldn't have been winsome enough. No map could have been clear enough. The the failure of the law of Moses to redeem anyone is clear proof of that. But in this season of Advent, we celebrate God with us. We celebrate a glorious visitation of Emmanuel. God with us. If you fall asleep right now, and some of you may have good reason to fall asleep right now, if the three words, God with us, is all you hear today, you have enough to set your heart on fire with joy and glory and hope. God with us in Christ, God came to us to redeem us. Now, I hope you won't fall asleep, and I'm going to do everything I can. And if you hear me get excited, maybe one or two of you are falling asleep, because that's what I do. I try to wake, keep you awake. But brothers and sisters, friends, guests, children, God has come. God has come to us. The importance of this is that our lives are lived rightly when they are lived knowing that Christ came to us and that he promised to come Again, to take us to live with him in new creation bodies, in new creation dwellings, and new creation employments with Emmanuel himself. Christ has come, and he has promised to come again to take us to be with him forever. And if you don't understand those two realities, that Christ has come and he's coming again, you will live your life wrong. 
You will be miserable, you will be confused, you will be without hope and without joy. But if you understand that Christ has come and he's coming again, this life can be filled with joy and hope and purpose and meaning. He will be our God and we will be his people. Oh, what a glorious promise that is. And because of the work of Christ, we will know life in all of its Edenic intimacy and eternal glory. We will live free from sin and in perfect fellowship with our good shepherd. What a glorious reality secured for us in Christ. What a glorious reason to praise and what a glorious reason to rejoice in Christ. I want to walk through a passage of scripture with you this morning which says Jesus which in which Jesus says for this purpose I was born and for this purpose I have come into the the world. You may have read this text and thought, uh, is it Good Friday? I thought it was Christmas time. No, the reason we're looking at this particular text that may not strike you as a Advent text is because Jesus says those words, for this reason I was born. So before I get into our passage, let's spend some time in prayer, just asking the Lord to help a weak individual like me um, be a faithful servant of this glorious scripture and this glorious truth. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for your word, and I thank you that even the simple reading of holy scripture is enough to transform a person's life. Lord, I know it to be the truth that you take what is little and you make much. And so I ask, Lord, that you would simply use me Pour out your spirit upon me and be delighted to bless what I have prepared and what I say, to be um, work done to build up your kingdom. Lord, build up your saints, grant the good gift of joy in Christ. And if there are any here this morning, Father, who are still under a slavery to sin, who are still under the deceptive rule of Satan, and have not yet come to rejoice in Christ by grace through faith, Lord, would you do the work that only you can do. Lord, be pleased to use the ministry of your word to do this now. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. The truth is a challenging thing to nail down. People argue and debate because we don't know what exactly is true. Uh, Much was said, particularly during this um, season of elections and votes, that there was much um, doubt in our nation's media because people aren't confident that we're getting told the truth. We're confident that people are talking. We're confident that we're hearing information But we as a nation largely are not confident that what we're hearing is true. This applies to elections, but this also applies to the way marriages work. This applies to the way churches work. This applies to the world of uh, advertisement. Does this product work? Is this review a true review or not? What What am I doing? What am I getting? And living in reality requires us to have some grasp of what's true and what's not. To be able to sift out what's false, what's wrong-headed, and what's true. And if we get steered away from the truth, we can have some hard words to say, can't we? You ever been convinced of something that wasn't true? You were confident that what you were planning to do was right on the money. This is true, this is good, and you found out too late that the information you were working with wasn't true. That can be a terrible situation, isn't it? And it's remarkable as we come to this interaction between Pilate primarily and Jesus that the central feature, the central pursuit, the central thing on trial, though Jesus is on trial, truth is also on trial. So is there relevance in this passage? If you need truth to live in the world that you live in, then this passage is relevant. The interaction between Jesus and Pilate is absolutely meaningful and has great value to you because truth has great value to us. 
So as we work through uh, the last half of chapter 18 and the first half of chapter 19, I simply want to press this one singular big idea upon you, and I hope that it's simple enough that you can walk away remembering it. But as we think about the reason for Jesus' birth, this is the big idea I want to press in. Simply this, Jesus was born to make the truth known. Jesus was born to make the truth known. As we work through our passage this morning and we work towards making this big idea clear, uh, I want to take two separate elements, two separate points, and I want to focus on each of these. Uh, And hopefully by the end, it will be clear to you that Jesus was born to make the truth known. So the first point I want to hit this morning, the first thing I want to draw out of our passage is the truth of Christ. What did Jesus teach? What was he revealing? And secondly, the audience of Christ. Who was he speaking to? Who was receiving his teaching and his witness of the truth? Last time, big idea, Jesus was born to make the truth known, the truth of Christ, the audience of Christ. All right, let's look at this first point, the truth of Christ. So as we approach this text this morning, we see it clearly portrayed, even as we're jumping in the middle of some action that's already going on, we see it clearly portrayed that Jesus took on frail humanity And the leaders of his day abused his body with terrible hatred and neglect. Even if you were only half paying attention uh, while the passage was being read, it's pretty clear that Jesus, the man, Jesus in his body is being abused by these people around. You may not be able to pronounce all the names or what exactly these locations are, but it's pretty clear that Jesus is being abused. Prior to the events of our text, just to set our passage in its proper context, Jesus has been unlawfully arrested. He's been dragged through deeply prejudiced court proceedings. Close friends have betrayed, abandoned, and denied him. And this context in which Jesus expresses the purpose of his birth is one which is filled with intense opposition and lowliness. What Jesus is doing, the words that he shares with us in this passage, required him to go through significant difficulty before he could say them. Okay? So to see the, the, the passage in its proper context, you have to understand that even before his crucifixion, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has chosen to suffer to make this message known. When a person who's lived a comfortable life and takes more steps of comfort so that you could know something, there may be some value in that. But when a man walks through fires, when a man is abused, when a man chooses to be abandoned and denied and be uh, overwhelmed with opposition and loneliness, I think think there's an increase in our understanding of how valuable that message is. Does that make sense? A person who says, I'll tell you my favorite thing about uh, rock and roll music if you come to my house and find me on my couch, I'll talk to you about it. But the man who says, I would climb over mountains, I would, I would swim the English Channel to talk to you about the Beatles, that per- you're, you're a little more interested to hear that story, right? Well, maybe, maybe not, depends. I, The point I want to make clear is that Jesus has already gone through the fire so that he could have this conversation. And what he is telling us is so incredibly important that I think it's wise for us to pay attention. As we get to verse 33 then, that verse tells us that when the Jewish leaders brought Jesus to the Roman prefect, Pilate took Jesus aside for questioning. He asked Jesus, Are you king of the Jews? To which Jesus replied, Do you say this of your own accord, or do others say it to you about me? 
Now, Jesus' response may be a little bit confusing. We're kind of like, Jesus, just give us a clear answer. But it's important to understand why he doesn't give a clear answer. And so, even though he doesn't give us a clear, the clear yes, we might expect from one who, quote, came into the world to bear witness to the truth, as we see in verse 37, this response from Jesus isn't a simple yes, but instead, he asks the origin of Pilate's question. So before he asks answers the question, he asks the question to clarify the question. This is good wisdom, but it also reveals what Jesus is about. He wants to know if Pilate is asking from personal curiosity or from a simple parroting of what others have said. Are you coming to me as a person who's genuinely curious, who's followed me and is wanting to know who I am, or are you simply repeating what others have said to you? It's important to Jesus where this question is coming from. As Jesus bears witness to the truth before Pilate, he reaches past Pilate's words and into his heart. It may seem like Jesus is dodging the question and not giving a yes, but I want you to see he's, he's reaching past the simple question and he's reaching into Pilate's heart. Where is this question coming from? Jesus wants to know Pilate and why Pilate is asking this question. According to Jesus, the truth is not simply something written down in notebooks, but something received with the whole heart, with the whole self. Why does it matter where this question is coming from? Why does it matter what posture Pilate is approaching? Because to Jesus, the truth is not just something you need to be able to regurgitate. The truth is not just something you need to be able to spit out at at quiz time. The truth is not just something you write down in a notebook. It's not just something you paint on, a, on an easel and hang on the wall. The truth is something received with the heart. Kids, I want you to hear this. The truth is not just something you retain in your mind and be able to spit out the right answers at the right time. Jesus is answer to Pilate, this first response, he's reaching past Pilate's words and he's reaching into his heart because Jesus is communicating to you and to every single one of us that the truth is not just something you have in your head. The truth is something you you grasp with your heart. Your whole self grasps the truth. The heart is not just something you know with your mind. The heart is something that is received with the whole self or it's not truly received at all. Pilate's response in verse 35 is a clear stiff arm to Jesus' heart-seeking question. Pilate senses Jesus reaching into his heart, and he says, back up. Pilate doesn't really care about whether Jesus is a true authority or not. He simply wants to get a statement and get his job done so that he can get on with his life. Pilate is interviewing the Son of God, and in his mind, he has better things to do. Jesus' question and Pilate's response is reminiscent of an earlier conversation Jesus had with his disciples. In Luke 9, Jesus asked his disciples, Who do the crowds say that I am? The disciples repeated what they had heard from the crowds. Some say John the Baptist, Elijah, or one of the prophets of old. This awareness of cultural opinion had some value to Jesus, but he was chiefly concerned with what was going on in the heart of the disciples. Jesus wasn't simply giving a quiz that he could give a pass-fail response to. Jesus wanted to know, not only for Pilate, but also with his disciples, what's going on in your heart as you have are responding to the truth. And that's exactly what's going on when Jesus asked asked his disciples, you've said what other people are saying about me, but who do you say that I am? That's something to be studied and something to be aware of and something to be repeated and known. But what I'm really concerned about is what you think of me. Who do you say that I am? We see that same persistence, that same care for the individual in Pilate and also his disciples. As Jesus came into the world to testify to the truth, 
we must first learn from him that truth is not simply something to grasp with our minds and regurgitate at the right time. Jesus isn't simply concerned with our ability to say the right things about him and give the right answers in Sunday school or to some Christian family member that asks. Jesus is chiefly concerned with how you answer the question, who do you say that I am? What do you actually believe about Jesus? There's always a lot of interacting with uh, with known people that you don't know very well at Christmas and holidays, right? We're going to see Aunt so-and-so. We haven't seen her since this time. We're going to see Grandpa Joe or whatever the case may be. And a lot of times there's, a, there's that religious person in your family that might ask a pointed question that you won't hear until the last time. And you just want to be able to say, yes, Grandma, I love Jesus. Yes, Jesus is the Son of God. Yes, Jesus died for my sins. And we just want to regurgitate those facts. But I want to press into those of you who maybe have already established a pattern of just saying the right answer. Jesus is calling out to you, who do you say that I am? Don't give me the right answer. Who do you say that I am? Jesus' response to Pilate's impersonal and uncaring attitude is seen in verse 36. Again, I'm just blown away that Pilate kind of stiff arms Jesus and Jesus doesn't just give up on the guy. All Pilate cares about is himself. And he's selfishly approached Jesus and then Jesus answered his question by saying, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. Jesus reveals himself according to the manner in which Pilate seeks him. All Pilate cares about is whether or not Jesus is leading a violent revolt. And Jesus makes clear that his kingdom is not rising up against Rome with swords, Jesus doesn't deny his true kingship, but clarifies the accusation against him by clarifying that he is a different kind of king over a different kind of kingdom. As we hear this testimony of truth from Jesus, we would do well to pay attention. Jesus is admitting, hear me clearly, Jesus is admitting and making it plain that he is a rightful ruler and authority. He is making it plain that he is one to be heard and obeyed. If we know anything about kings, we know you don't just dismiss them. We know you don't just act politely and eagerly to get out of their presence. Jesus makes it plain that he is a king, that it's right for him to be heard and to be obeyed. He's not someone we can ignore and reject without consequence. Do you understand what that means? Yes, you have the freedom and the capacity and the ability to ignore Jesus, to refuse him, to be too busy for him. You have the ability to do that, but not without consequence. If you rudely reject the king, there will be consequences. Jesus' kingship is true, yet his kingdom is something different from the nations and empires of this world. Pilate's concern for a people attacking him uh, and running off with his wealth is clearly assuaged by Jesus' answer that his kingdom is not of this world. Jesus' kingdom is not competing for the riches of any king or the resources of any kingdom. Jesus' kingdom is a heavenly kingdom and, it concern, and its concerns do not engage in violent uprisings. Friends, Jesus testifies to the truth that he is king. Kids, do you hear me? Jesus really truly is a king. We don't just say Jesus is king like we name our Golden Retriever King or something crazy like that. It's not just some title or some cute name. 
Jesus really truly is the king. Have you received this truth with genuine submission and confidence in his leadership? Or are you simply mouthing the words, Jesus is king? Does everyone understand the difference between a person that says, Jesus is king, in the manner that this is the right answer to the question, and the person who says, Jesus is the king, as a statement of the reality of the way a person lives? Do you understand the difference between those two? And this is where I'm really pressing in on you, where I really want you to to, to think and to understand, who do you say Jesus is? I I could care less if you know all the right answers to the quiz. But I want you to know Jesus for who he really, truly is. Is Jesus king? Or is that simply the right answer to some Jeopardy question? How we we receive Jesus as king is evident in the way we live our lives. If you believe COVID is is dangerous, you will see it in the way a person lives. If you believe that COVID is an imagined disease, you will see it in the way a person lives. If you believe that Jesus is king, you will see it in the way they live. If Jesus is your true king, then your life will be marked by choices that reflect the kingdom you belong to. Is your life lived pursuing an earthly kingdom of comfort, reputation, and storing up for yourselves treasures that rot, rust, and bust or bounce around with the stock market? Are you living for that kind of kingdom? Or is your life lived pursuing a heavenly kingdom that will not pass away? I'm not so concerned with seeing some ID card, but if you belong to a heavenly kingdom, your life is going to look different. Pilate understood that. This guy's got some otherworldly kingdom. This is no threat to me. These are two different kinds of kings. I'm not worried about this man that doesn't have an earthly kingdom. Brothers and sisters, friends, if Jesus is king and you are a part of his kingdom, your life will reflect that. Your priorities are different. Pursuing the kingdom of heaven will shrink your earthly comforts. It will ruin your hopes of greatness in this life. But if Jesus is your king, you will count these losses as no big deal in comparison to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus our Lord. As Pilate receives Jesus' testimony to be the king of a kingdom not from this world, Jesus then makes his life's purpose and value clear in verse 37. Jesus says, For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone, everyone who is of the truth, of the truth, listens to my voice. The first half of this statement is terribly weighty and packed with significance. Many characters in many stories have made statements like this. And when a figure in the movie or the book you're reading says, this is my life's purpose, or this here, this is my destiny, or when that character says, this is why I was born, we know that what is about to be said or accomplished is of unparalleled, oh Lord, help me speak, unparalleled importance. You know that you're in the crescendo of the story when the main character says, this is why I was born. As in those stories, so also with Jesus. If you fail to understand what he says and what he does next, you will completely misunderstand Jesus. You understand what I'm, what I'm communicating here? The pivotal, ultimate moment of what Jesus is saying, why he came to earth. If you don't understand this role, this, this, this act, action of Christ, if you don't understand this, you have some weird, made-up understanding of Jesus. 
The Jesus you know is a fake Jesus. If you don't understand what this is saying. In the same way that if you don't understand what Frodo Baggins is doing at the ultimate moment, you don't understand the story. If you don't understand what the main character is doing at the height of importance, you you miss the whole thing. If you fail to understand what Jesus does and says here, you will completely misunderstand him. And what Jesus says next is no small matter. What he says pertains to every single person who has lived, is currently living, or will ever live in days to come. Feel the weight of that statement. Very, very, very precious things to you have no meaning to people who've never, who have lived thousands of years ago. Much that is important and much that, that bears the weight of your thinking will have no meaning to people who will be born to your children. But what is being said, what is being done, what is being communicated has singular importance to every person, past, present, and future. Jesus says, I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. The truth. Is there anything more important to speak about? The truth. And then hear these strong words. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. There's a part of me that's Minnesota nice and wants to apologize for being so intense and trying to keep everybody looking at me and listening to me. But if Jesus says, if you don't listen to me, you've missed the boat. You're living in some fake reality built on lies if you don't listen to my voice. And so on behalf of Jesus as one of his ambassadors, please listen. Listen, pay attention. Jesus hasn't simply come to preach or teach the truth, but to bear witness to it. He isn't regurgitating facts. He has learned from books and teachers. His relationship and experience of reality surpasses that of every human being that has ever lived. Understand, a witness to the truth is different than one who has been taught the truth. A witness to the truth is different than I've had really good teachers my whole life. Do you understand the difference of it? Jesus' experience of reality, of truth, surpasses every single person, past, present, future. The Gospel of John doesn't introduce us to Jesus with a birth narrative like Matthew, Mark, and Luke do. Instead, John chooses to introduce us to Jesus, the witness to the truth like this. In John 1, we read, In the beginning was the Word, And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth." Hear me, Jesus is not only a teacher of the truth, but he is existence and reality itself. Nothing existed until Jesus gave it existence. There was no reality until Jesus created that reality. Jesus is not simply a teacher of the truth, but he is a witness of the truth. He is from the Father and full of grace and full of truth. Who else could testify more accurately? Who else could be a better witness than him? Who could tell us about what reality actually is than the one who created it and sustains it himself? In chapter 14 of this gospel, John records even more of Jesus' impressive credentials. John 14, verse 6, quotes Jesus as saying, I am the way and the truth and the life. Who else could teach and tell and testify to reality and the true nature of existence better than Jesus, who is truth himself? Do you understand the the point I'm trying to make here? How can I know the truth? 
You have certain flawed options of news sources, and all of them are trash compared to Jesus, who is the truth. Some school books are way better than other school books, but Jesus Christ is truth itself. People often bristle at the dogmatic and excluding language of Jesus when he tells Pilate, everyone who's of the truth listens to my voice. It's clearly implied if you don't listen to Jesus, you've missed the truth. People bristle at that, and maybe even the way I'm speaking and the way I'm interacting with is, is hard for you to listen to. Why? It's so exclusive and so singular. But stop for a second. Think about that. If Jesus is the creator of every man, woman, bird, and flower, and by his power everything exists, then how could he speak any other way? How could Jesus say, there's a lot of good teachers in the world, and I just want you to consider me as one of those good teachers that you can choose from? There are a lot of people who know the truth and can tell you the truth, and you have a choice to, to choose from them. And Jesus, I, I just want you to consider me as, as just one source of truth. He would have to deny his godness to be able to speak like that. Jesus Christ at this very moment knows how many hairs are on the top of your head, how many hairs are on the left side of your part, and how many hairs are on the right side of your part. For some of you, that you were, we're talking about decades ago when you had hair to part, right? Jesus knows. He can't come as one of many and say, choose me or not, whatever. He can't do that. He is truth itself. And he has come. This is the glory of Advent. The truth himself has come to make the truth known. People often bristle at this, but friends, consider, how else could he speak? How else could Jesus, the creator, the sustainer, the son of God, how else could he present himself? Jesus has a human nature like the many philosophers and religion creators of the world, but he is so much more. And that more makes him the final arbiter and judge of what is true and false. If you do not listen to Jesus, you do not listen to the truth, plain and simple. If you reject reality, if you reject Jesus' kingly rule, you reject reality and you are living in some self-made fantasy. The truth of Christ is that he alone is the perfect witness and herald of what is true. He came to earth from his heavenly dwelling with the Father where he upholds reality by the word of his power. He is king of the kingdom of heaven and truth itself. Every person must reckon with him. And those who refuse him reject reality by suppressing the truth in, un in unrighteousness. There are none who walk in the truth or according to reality, who walk apart from Christ. Jesus is the truth, and we must receive him with the heart of faith and not simply the shallow waters of our mind. I've said a lot. My throat is telling me you've said a lot. Let me bring it to this point. Who do you say that Jesus is? I'm not worried about your spouse. I'm not worried about your family. I'm not worried about your grandkids. I'm not worried about your neighbors. Who do you say Jesus is? Jesus came as the witness to the truth and the king of the only eternal kingdom. His words come to many audiences, but I want to look at one particular audience before we finish. And so let's look now at this second point, the audience of Christ. Much can and, and could and should be said about the energetic and violent audience of the Jewish leaders and the Roman soldiers in this passage. 
but I want to let them pass into the background for now, and I want to make a few observations about Pontius Pilate, the governor of Judea. The Jewish people were subordinate to Rome and thus didn't have authority to carry out capital punishment. Pilate was drawn into this scene with Jesus because the Jewish Sanhedrin needed Rome to do the executing for them. It's pretty clear that Pilate hasn't hunted Jesus down for crimes committed against Rome. Pilate is responsible for governing the Jews in his region, and their request to prosecute Jesus isn't something he's terribly motivated to do. There's a lot of excitement coming from the Jews, but Pilate really doesn't care. The Jews are hot with anger, and Pilate seems to be pretty calm and cool. The Jews are intense and focused. Pilate's dismissive, full of compromises. Pilate asks some basic questions about the charges against Jesus, and when Jesus claims to bear witness to the truth, Pilate dismisses him with a mocking statement. What is truth? What's truth? Pilate's eager to move on and get rid of Jesus. He tells the Jews plainly, I find no fault in him. And then in verse 39, he uses the tradition of releasing a prisoner for Passover, and he's engaging with the Jews, but the Jews would rather have Barabbas, a proven and guilty murderer, thief, and insurrectionist. They'd rather have him walking the streets than Jesus. Pilate is surprised that they don't take this bargain, that they are still focused on getting Jesus executed. Pilate had Jesus then beaten by cruel soldiers in hopes that he could get out of all the paperwork of a full-blown execution. He again told the Jews in verse 19, or in chapter 19, verse 4, I find no guilt in him. And in hopes that these religious nuts would be satisfied, he presented the beaten Jesus to them in verse 5, saying, Behold, the man, an innocent man beaten, And when the Jews weren't satisfied, but instead cried out for Jesus' crucifixion, Pilate tried yet again to get rid of this burden by telling the Jews to leave him alone and announcing for the third time in verse 6, I find no guilt in him. As you're reading a passage and you find the same phrase repeated three times, don't miss it. Jesus is standing trial and the man holding him accountable finds no guilt in him. Verse 12 tells us that Pilate, quote, sought to release Jesus, but when the Jews persisted and accused him of betraying Caesar, Pilate finally gave in to the passions of the religious men who pressed him for action. Pilate just wants Jesus to go away. Truth incarnate is standing in his, his property and just wants him to leave. He's got other things to do. Pilate tried desperately to not make a decision about Jesus. He didn't really care about the dueling religious claims at his front door. He simply wanted some peace and quiet. Maybe that's you. Maybe that's somebody you know. They don't care about the religious duels going on in the world. They don't care about passionate pursuit of truth. Just want some peace and quiet. But then Pilate was faced with an ultimatum. Either you abandon Jesus and the truth, lead him off into crucifixion, or you will lose your peace, your position, your reputation, and your wealth. We will rat you out to Caesar, and you will be disposed or worse. Only this ultimatum, only under these conditions did Pilate take a stand. Only under the ultimate and utmost pressure did he grow a backbone and make a choice. Unfortunately, He showed his devotion to created things instead of the creator. Much can be learned from Pilate, but I simply want to highlight his cool passivity. We could talk on and on and on about the things we learned from Pilate, but I simply want you to see how cool and passive and uninterested he is in great debates and with Jesus and and the real truth. Pilate looked Jesus in the face and couldn't wait to get rid of him. Feel the weight of that? Pilate was standing in front of the good news himself, 
and couldn't wait to get back to the things he deemed more important. The desire of nations was at his front door, but his desire was to get back to the way things were. Pilate's response to Jesus reflects the response of many today. So many men, so many women, so many young people will die apart from Christ. They will perish in the eternal torment of hell because they simply don't want to be disturbed. Many will live decent, moral lives and die in their unbelief because they didn't want to risk losing their momentary comforts by embracing Jesus. Why would I wrestle with whether or not the Gospels are reliable? I'm comfortable. I'm too busy making money. I'm too busy investing. I'm too busy learning about these different types of of stocks. I don't have time to make up my mind about Jesus. Many know the facts of the Christian gospel, and some even have seminary credentials on their wall, but they never receive Jesus in faith as the king of the kingdom. Manny could get up here and tell you what this philosopher and this theologian and this 18th century preacher said about Jesus, but when it comes down to it for themselves, they haven't embraced him as the truth. Christ has come to bear witness to the truth. In some senses, the complicated realm of philosophy and truth and the pursuit of knowledge, all of that complexity is made utterly simple in Christ. Do you receive my word or not? I don't need to know anything about German philosophers. I don't need to know anything about uh, Swiss theologians. What have you done with Jesus Christ? Jesus has come to bear witness to the truth, the truth. And what you do with Jesus is more important than what you do with anything else in your whole entire life. It's more important than anybody does with their entire life. And so if it comes down to simply receiving Jesus as king or not, Let me plead with you to receive him as your king. Submit to his rule. Treasure his word. And live as a a member of his kingdom. And I particularly want to lean on you and plead with those of you who are even right now looking at your watch wondering when this guy is going to quit. I'm getting hungry here. I'm thirsty My couch is so comfortable. We've got lunch plans. You're just like Pilate. Drew, how do you know people think that way? Because I think that way. I'm not pointing the finger that isn't already pointing at me. Brothers and sisters, friends, don't miss Jesus like Pilate missed Jesus because you were fixated on something else. Truth comes to you. Truth himself put on flesh, became an infant, exited the womb of Mary, took the time to learn language, endured suffering so that he could come and make all the troubles of human philosophies and the, and the variety of religions that are in the world simply to come to you and make it terribly simple. Do you listen to me or not? Do you live as if I'm the king of all or not? It's really that simple. And if right now you're thinking, I just want to go home and eat. You will have missed the truth. And the 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 years that you have left will not only be wasted, 
but they will be a precursor to the eternal torment because you will have missed truth and you will have missed paradise. I want to be comfortable. I want to get out of awkward situations. I want people's anxious requests to be done away with too. But in the desire to get out of those situations, don't miss the truth. Jesus Christ is the witness to the truth, and Jesus Christ has presented himself plainly to you through the preaching of the word this morning. Who do you say that he is?